What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Verzi Effect podcast show. My name is Paul Verzi, and you guys listening to episode, wow, this is 556. I don't know what that means as far as with video, but um, I am back. I'm out of the studio in my home studio office here uh, in beautiful upstate New York, and I have a guest, another guest, uh, a guy that um, I actually met um, on Bobby Kelly's podcast, YKWD. Um, hit it off. This guy made me laugh right away. And then just every time I've seen him or run into him, we've always had some some good laughs, some good little uh, improv uh, moments. And uh, he's here now on the Verzi Effect. Funny, funny stand up. He was going to plug something, but he's going to plug that, <laughs> plug that yeah. later. So we're just going to shoot the shit. But Detroit's own Dave Landau. Dave, thanks so much for being on, bud. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, man. No, no, no worries, man. I remember, um, I remember, I forgot what podcast it was on, but we were talking about, I think it was like the mellowness of Billie Eilish's music. And we were oh, just James we were Bond, t- the James <laughs> Bond. And we were just being the, we were being like James Bond being tied down. And with that music on, we were just saying, just kill me. And dude, we, it went so, it was so fucking, cause you're one of those guys. And I love guys like this, where, isn't it cool when, when you're in this business, you come across a comic and you may not hang with them all the time, you know, or they could be from Mississippi and you're from wherever, but when you see them, the jokes just flow and one guy says something and then the next follows it. You're just like, oh, you know what? If me and this person were in the same, like we came up in the same like time and we came up in the same city, we would hang out all the time. That's what I felt. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was a fun show, too, because I think we were calling hot man. I think we were calling the bomb thing. Uh, Tomorrow doesn't matter. <laughs> and it was just the like. There's it was no- just her voice of just this utter melancholy, like depression. And it was supposed to be the soundtrack to Bond. I mean, was the soundtrack to Bond. And I just remember we were like discussing, like, like we don't need shocks. We don't need just, just kill me. I don't like just, just load just... the Luger. And no, <laughs> yeah. no, but, uh, but do you find that's what I wanted to talk about? I wanted to talk about what you think of like, and you'd be an interesting guy to talk about this too. What you think the state of like talent and show business is because now it seems like. And not that we're old, like I'm, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm recently 40. Like I'm not, we're not old. I'm also 40. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's like, it's one of those things where like, you're not old, but I remember when we were coming up, like you had to have like, there there had to be something more than like, it feels like now if you just have a microphone and a recorder and like a family member to help hold the camera, like you could fucking build an empire. And that's, I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing, but talent is not what it once was. Do you feel like that a little bit or? Oh yeah. And I mean, it's hard to say without being bitter, you know, sounding bitter because uh, truthfully I'm not, you know, it's like, it's just a different way of starting. Cause when I started, it was like, I kind of started in 01 with Second City, then jumped in in 04. And it was about going up in Detroit. And it was lucky there's like nine different spots. You could you could do an urban club, like a more upscale suburban. Like you do everything in one night. Mm -hmm. And the way that it was, was like you had to build your way up by even getting respect from other comics. Maybe somebody helping you out, recommending to you to MC. Like even the girl who got a bottle chucked at her at Uncle Vinny's and like it it hit or the can got she got thrown at her and now she's on like Kimmel and stuff i don't it's just funny that happened to me with a glass bottle the first time i ever hosted a comedy show so i was watching that and i'm like yeah there were no camera phones it just <laughs> i i just had to end the show cuz they shut down the world series at a sports bar to start comedy night i'm looking at the owner i'm like is this the oh. best idea you think he's like yeah they don't mind i'm like they're booing now and I walked the up. Show, the show didn't start. <laughs> and I walked up and I'm like, how's everybody doing? And a bottle just exploded behind me. And I was like, good night, everybody. And he... uh, uh, yeah, no. And that's what I want to say. Like, there's actually me and you were very fortunate that, you know, we're doing well in our careers and things are going good. So there's no bitterness. When My question was basically, I shouldn't have said talent. I should have said opportunity is really different because and listen, 
I can't knock somebody making that money and I can't knock somebody no. feeding their family and I can't knock somebody flick. I always say it. I'm not going to like, if you're filling, I always say this all the time. I don't sound like a broken record. If you're filling up theaters because you figured out to do a dance on TikTok, or whatever, God bless you. But I'm just saying we're in it. Like me and you came up where I don't know what it was like in Detroit. I came up where I had to drive to New York city. Mm -hmm. I had to beg for stage time. There were really no cameras. So killing, killing in that club that night meant, Oh, somebody there would hopefully invite me to another bar or something. Yeah. And I would continue that thing from going where now it's like, you know, there was somebody like mouthing, like lips, lip syncing, whatever, like speeches and they get, they're getting things. So it's just a different time, but as there's people getting famous lip syncing. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that. I know comics who now sell tickets because somebody else that was like a 15 year old girl was lip syncing their stand up. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's I mean. It's insane like, to me. It's it really is like, uh, I guess, like you said, it's good and bad. But there is a part not to be like of some old man, but there is a part to be like, I was in a shitty condo with a bitter comic. I was in a shitty yes. condo with a bitter comic doing a shitty dude. I remember. What's the worst gig you've done for the least amount of money? I did one for well, I, when I drove to Milwaukee and the guy, they, I had to, it was, I got 350 for the weekend and I had to comedy fight for the, cafe. And I, yes, yes. Okay. I had a feeling just in the start of the sentence. <laughs> so yeah. 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 It, I drove to Milwaukee <laughs> and they were like, Oh, we'll give you three. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't justify three. And like, I had to really fight. They're like, all right, we'll give you 350. And I drove 15 hours and I did that. And uh, luckily I got my own hotel because I was with my brother, but I heard their condo looked like a meth lab. Yeah. Um, you stayed in it? Yeah. I went there once the guy, one of the guys who owned it ended up having this big tumor on the side of his head. And like the side of his face, not it was it was not cancerous. I think it was just karma, but it was on the side of his face. And uh, I, I put his name into my phone under love bump for some reason, just because I kept calling it a love bump. Oh, and then he, I was staying next to him and he goes, you got my number, right? And he texts me and love bump comes up. Oh, my God. Dude. He's like, what? That's not my name. Like, he didn't get it. Thank God. But he just got this thing dangling on his neck. He's like, yeah, oh. love bumps. Not my name. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> but no, that's oh man, I I can't. There's so many that I think I've blacked a lot of them out. Like there's ones where I've gone to where, just especially through the south, um, and I've checked into places where you're like, oh, this is for like this is for prostitutes only and soldiers that are coming to have sex with these prostitutes. Yeah, and I and I walk in and like I remember this one place. I walk in. And I just start walking across the floor in my socks. And by the time I get to the bed, my my socks are muddy. Like, that is how oh. dirty the hotel oh room my. was. Oh. And then, yeah, like, there's another one where a crackhead kept peering in the window like Jurassic Park. Oh, my. And that was in the south. That was in Mississippi. Like, she just kept staring in the side of it. And this oh. room didn't have a bed. It was a hotel, but it had a pullout couch oh. and a terrible kitchen. And they were just like, yeah, there you go. Like, there's your morale. Come do well at our show tonight. But I mean, dude, there's so many bad ones. I can't like it. I know it's like it's like it's like you said before. It's like you almost blacked them out. It's like, you know, the way they say when people get molested, they remember at 40 yeah. because their yeah. brain just like that's that's kind of what it is in comedy. It's like you get to a certain point and there are certain things that are just painful to remember. Yeah, there's so many moments where you're just sad and you're like, I like I remember I did a casino once and my friend and I just ate shit. And then we're in the bathroom and the guy looks right at us and he's like, yeah, I kind of wanted to tell those comics, to, you know, don't quit your day job. And oh. we're looking at him. We're like, we're literally the comics. Oh, my God. Do like you ever literally... I've actually <laughs> I've actually had that happen where I did my set and I went to the bathroom where the the patrons are in. And I remember standing there pissing and there's a bunch of people in there. And all I thought, I just wanted to write, all I thought was if one of these people say that that sucked or I didn't like that guy, that was my biggest fear. So I just like shook it and like did like a, a quick rinse and just ran out. And luckily yeah. I didn't hear it, but that's gotta be <laughs> soul crushing, dude. dude. The worst ever, I think like the strangest thing was I, this was when I, 
maybe like 06 or something or 07. I got like live at Gotham a week later and I think it was just God being like, here, I'm sorry. But I was in, uh, oh man, where was it? It was somewhere in Virginia, but in like the mountains. So it might've been West Virginia and it was a holiday in lounge. So, you know, it's going to be a good night and I'm probably making like a hundred bucks as a part of this run. And I get to my hotel room and the phone rings and it just goes, the voice just goes clown. And I just hung up. I'm like, oh, that's funny. And the, mind you, I'm like, you know, I'm 22, 23, whatever. And it's like, phone rings again. I pick it up. Clown. It's the clown. And I was like, yeah, I'm not. I'm a comic. Thanks. He goes, no, I'm the headliner. I'm the clown. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> And he goes, I need you to come down to my room and talk to me right now. We got to figure out the plan for tonight. And I was like, no, I'm good. I, 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 I'm fine. I just meet you at the show. He's like, I'll talk to you later. Rings again. Hey, don't hang up on me. And I go, I'm just trying to take a nap, dude. I just drove here like, you know, it was some nine, 10 hour drive from Detroit. What? And he goes, just come down, just come down to my room. And I'm like, all right, I'll come down eventually. Like, what's the number? And he's like, I need you to come down right now. And I go, all right, all right. So I walk down to the room, not kidding. And it's kind of like propped open, you know, where just the door is on the hook. And yes. uh, and from being on the road many years, you know, the way a whore would in a terrible motel. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Like like it's like the it's like the motel invite. Yes. Yeah. The, just this room is open. and You can come in. Yeah. So I go in and there's a guy smoking crack on the bed. What? There's two beds. The room's all dark. And the guy's smoking crack on the bed. And he goes, do you want some crack? And I go, I'm good. And then I look over, and I'm not kidding, shirtless. And there's only one light on in the room. But the, he has a lamp, and the lamp is tilted to his face with full clown makeup and a, uh, like, slash top hat. And he's what? smoking. And he's like, I'm the clown, whatever. And I'm like, uh, okay he's like do you smoke i'm like i'm good right like i did but i'm like i don't want to extend this visit yeah, so i'm yeah. like no i'm good what uh what do you want to talk about you know and like and i'm just trying to make sense of this because now i'm in west virginia half naked clown in front of me crack smoke on the bed and we're in the holiday and getting ready to do the lounge she goes let me tell you something my brother's a hell's angel what? And he goes, if you're not off stage in 10 minutes tonight, all the Hell's Angels are going to come and they're going to start booing you off stage. And I was like, OK, which I mean, in, in the Hell's Angels community, <laughs> that's just stolen valor. But I'm like, okay. I'm like, OK. Uh, yeah. And he goes, so I want he's like, you need to make sure that you are off that stage the second that I get on. I'm like, the second I get down there, 10 minutes, that's all you're going to do. And I'm thinking like, great. I really only have 20 and I'm stretching that anyway. So yeah, I'll do 10 and then bring you on. So I go there. There's no Hell's Angels. There's like two couples who aren't doing well in life. There's no Hell's Angels. <laughs> no, there's nothing. It's a holiday in bar filled with <laughs> like seven people who look like they would be in a holiday in bar in the mid 2000s. Like they're all dead now from liver failure. Oh my God. So I'm on stage. <laughs> And I do my 10 minutes and he goes on and just eats it. And then he squirts a guy with a squirt gun who almost beats the shit out of him in front of the entire place. And that was the first night I had to work with him. Oh, my God. Who? First of all, who booked that? Uh, I believe it was a Chuck Johnson room. I'll go ahead and say it. <laughs> I'll say his name. Dude, you're in West Virginia. And you, you know what's the funniest part about this is? He was the insecure one. You're the yes. opener. You're the opener. You're just going there. You drove there. You 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 know, and you're just like, were you married at the time or in a relationship? I was in a relationship with uh, my wife, but with yeah, your we, wife. Weren't, we weren't married. Right. So you're like, hey, honey, I'm I'm living my dream. I'm gonna drive out to West Virginia. You get to your room. You're tired. You're waiting, and then the headlining clown Correct. calls you there with a fucking crackhead, and he starts threatening a fake biker gang. Yes. Well, a biker gang that is fake in his world, as far as his friends. And <laughs> you're in a you're in a holiday in Latin, and then he's his closer was a water gun. I mean, that's like or whatever it was, dude. dude it was. And then I, years later, I saw him because I got called to do a club that was a really good club. And I showed up and I'm like, how is this guy 
the headline and like you just gave him a chance and he goes this is one of my favorite stories he goes well two if you got time yeah yeah go ahead first one he goes uh all right i need you to zip me up in the back and i go okay because he put on his costume and he turns around and the world trade center is on the back of his clown costume and i couldn't stop laughing like it was so loud, the entire audience turned around, like staring at me. And then uh, the, what? the other thing he goes, I walk in and he's wearing white gloves, right? And does he remember you from West Virginia or no? He's pretending he doesn't. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But he's definitely trying to do that big dog thing where okay, he's like, where it's just you know, like you're just the opener. Okay. Yeah, like I don't, I don't remember that. Like, oh, you don't remember when you said all those hell's angels were gonna come and you kept calling my room. Yeah, you don't remember crack in your... Yeah, this was funny, too, is I wrote the story online once, and uh, he got all pissed because he found it somehow, and he was like, I don't smoke crack. I'm like, I didn't say you smoke crack. I said, your guy who you called your tour manager, he smoked crack. Oh, okay. Oh, this is great. So I go into... <laughs> I go into the, the green room, and he goes, Dave, you might have to headline the show tonight. I go, why is that? So I was walking to my car last night, and I uh, two guys started making fun of me, right? So I beat the crap out of them, and I think I might have killed one of them. And I go, really? <laughs> I said, can I see your knuckles? And he goes, why? And I go, well, if you almost killed somebody, I imagine your knuckles have got to be destroyed. Could I see your knuckles? And he's like, no, man, no, no I'm not, I don't have to show you anything. And I'm like, oh, okay. I go, so let me get this straight. Where did this happen? He goes, right outside the parking lot. And I go, so the police heard that a clown murdered a man. And there's a poster <laughs> of you out front <laughs> of the club. So it would take, all they would have to do is look up and then go inside the to, to figure out the case. There's no <laughs> other clown in the area because the other one's still alive to point out who uh... would have murdered the other one. Oh shit, dude! So yeah, he <laughs> your headshot is up, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's you as a clown. And then he, <laughs> that's so great, yeah. dude. Ugh. Yeah. So he he's I'm like so they you're afraid they're gonna come and arrest you tonight right at eight o'clock for the show. And he's just like, well, I'm just letting you know. And I'm like, I I don't think you're gonna get arrested. I really don't. <laughs> I just oh my god i couldn't it was unbelievable but you're right it is that you meet certain people who are on the road and i was guess i never liked that but it who are so insecure yeah that's a good point that you say it that they take it out on everyone yeah and it's no. all about them like it's all about convincing you yeah. Tetsu, don't convince me. I, I don't have to live your life. Convince you you're not worthless. I mean, you're not doing a good job. Right, right. Well, the thing is, we're all, everybody's got insecurities about their act and am I funny and am I going to be funny enough? And all those are normal. But then you get a guy like that who has to call the guy opening for him and come up with a plan. It's yeah. like, what's the plan? We're going to go up, do our job and do our time. And it's either going to go good or not for us. And then that's it. And then it's like, yeah, dude, I've come across people in this business that you would never, ever think, ever think would be would lack confidence or would be insecure. And you talk to them and they're just like, I remember one time, dude, I won't say the name just for the, you know, but I was working with the fucking, uh, a legend and he's, he's older now, much older now. And, and I remember working with him and I did, was in North Carolina and I did really good. And I go, Oh dude, you're going to kill. You're going to yeah. fucking kill. And he was just like, Oh man, I don't know about that. Like with his head down. And I was just going like, what are you, you know, and it's like, you have to understand that, like, one thing I learned, and, and I don't want to say this in a bad way, there's a lot of damaged, mentally ill people. And listen, I suffer from anxiety, depression, OCD, we all have something, yeah. but then there are some people that you can really, like, visibly, dude, I saw something, I saw somebody on stage not long ago, just through a clip, because now there's clips of everybody, so many people you don't know, you just go through your phone and there's clips, but I saw this one person, and I was just like, oh, that person's out of their mind, like, that, like, it was just, like, that person is fucking crazy, like, that's, yes. it's just, it's part of what it is, but that clown guy, first of all, was he a stand-up clown, or was he doing clown? shit or was it well both? not to say his full name but i'll put it this way he was the opposite of gruntled <laughs> okay 
<laughs> okay. Okay. I <laughs> guess. And dude, that's got to be really a mind fuck when you're insecure while putting that make like while doing all that. Like, dude, that's got to yeah. be. You put a top hat on, a fucking nose, and then you're like, all right, who's opening? Like, that's fucking, dude, that's another. Well, one level. of uh, Stanhope's openers, I think it was Brett, maybe Erickson. It was a long time ago. But the guy has blocks on stage that say the letters, you know, uh, that just say letters like kid blocks. So he arranged them to say F A G. And right. then the guy did his whole show without realizing that that's what they said. So they watch the feature do it. So he's like surprised that he's killing so hard. And it's just because nobody's he's not getting what's behind him. And I remember him even writing on like, this was my space. You know, he was writing, uh, you know, I had a clown beating the shit out of me and I just had to rethink my life and everything that I've ever done. And I'm like, I know that feeling. I walked into a hotel room and thought the same thing where I was like, is this is this what this becomes? Like. And when, let me ask you a question. When he first called you in West Virginia and said clown, like what, what was his goal? Like, was he, I he... thought he thought he was calling me a clown. Cause I was a comic. I thought it was like going to be like the club owner or like the bartender. Cause why would you say that? Like, that's not how you introduce yourself. That's I love how you corrected. it. I love how you corrected. I'm going, no, well, I, I mean, I am a stand up. Yeah. <laughs> It's like I understand there were jesters. I I understand your connection, but no, I don't consider myself a clown. Oh, dude, dude, <laughs> that is so great. Well, one thing that was awesome, man, and I got to be honest, I was so genuinely happy when I saw I see you selling theaters, man. I see you Thank like you. going into theaters, packing them out, walking on stage and people going nuts, dude. And that's just like hustle, dude. That's just hustling, hard work and staying to it. And like I was just on another podcast recently talking to a comic where they were like, yeah, dude, I never knew if like things were going to happen. And they're like, and I saw you, Paul, and I saw that you had kids and I saw that things happened. And I was like, oh, it's, and I go, yeah, dude, you just, if you're funny, this is a game. You just got to stick in it and, and, and just keep doing what you like, you know, staying in it is part of, if you stay in it and you're talented and eventually people see it, something good's going to happen. So I'm glad that you're doing that, man. Dude, likewise. And I mean, I remember hearing that early on, a comic just said, stay in line. You're good. And it's just wow. stay in line. It's like, don't get out of line. Just stay in line and keep pushing. And that's the thing is now it's like, I've done well. It's like, but I have to keep pushing. I have to keep put like nothing will ever be yes. good enough about it. That's the best thing about the art is, you know, and it's like, and I'm on a show that uh, I enjoy. It can be polarizing because of the politics, but I'm sort of the moderate, uh, you know, on the show. Sure. But like when we, we tour and stuff, it's, you know, the crowd gets what they want. And it's like, I've had, to, you know, even since Kumia, there's like, there's a certain view of like, oh, what's his stand up? And it's like, no, my stand up is just life stories, really, about everything from just addiction to the movies that I watch now to what's happened in my life to like, and talking about stuff that I never even knew I could talk about and make funny. That's what I love is just yeah. being able to challenge the audience and myself. And it's not shocking humor it's just like here's me on acid talking to my dad who's dying in a halo here's why it's fun you know just stuff like that where yeah. like, you never thought and i i saw that in your last special in your special your netflix special you talking about like the divorce and how your dad <laughs> your mom and yeah said she, she, yeah and all that like and you she, could yeah. tell you could tell that that was something that you didn't you know you don't just start your career with that you have to build to the point where you're vulnerable enough, but secure enough to say that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I got to a point. Well, I appreciate that. And yeah, it's like, and same thing with you. It's like for you to talk about, you know, talk to your dad on acid while he's going through what he's going through. It's like, that's, yeah, you can't just come out of the gate. Very few comics can just come out of the gate and start doing that. That's why um, I was, people always say like, and, and I'm dear friends with him. So I'm always going to have his back, but people always talk about like, well, Pete Davidson, you know, he got an SNL. He did dude, Pete Davidson, when he was like 16, his only release was what listening to com comedy albums and watching comedy. And he was one of the few guys that like, he went up and talked about his single mom and like how, when she starts dating after his dad was gone, like, and I'm just going like, and I remember like Jim Brewer going, Holy shit. Like this, that's like, yeah. like Chappelle type vulnerability. It's very rare that somebody can early in their career. It's like you said, you got to be doing it for a while to go, no, dude, my dad basically said my mom had 
did these things and that's why they were divorced but i was able it with my experience enough but yeah dude that's awesome and and another thing too it's like it's so people will take oh that person's on that show so was what is their stand-up going to be about that's like no their stand-up is their stand-up dude their stand-up is just funny things like anything else yeah it's a separate it's a separate entity to what you what different things you might be on and it's interesting you say that about p because i did he he directed your special right he directed it, yep. Which is huge. And it's like whenever anybody, I had heard people complain about that, it's like, one, it's sour grapes kind of no matter what, when you think about it. You're just pissed that a 20-year-old got on a show, but you also didn't live the all those years with your dad dying in 9-11, all those other. But yeah. if you watch his audition tape, you go, oh, that's why, because he's a star and you're looking at him. The, that's the thing that people don't understand. Like, dude, I talked to Pete and he said something about a business meeting where he's literally sitting down. He's like sitting down with big business people in show business. And he's just no bullshit says what it is. And if they're like, Oh, we can't, he'll be like, like Pete's one of those guys. will be like, man, I don't know if you're like, sh I don't know if that's for you. And he'll be like, Oh man, dude, that's your opinion. I totally, Hey man, nice to meet you. And they're just like, Whoa. And that's the thing about Pete is like, Pete is this like, yeah, dude, you just nailed it, Dave. And it's, it's so funny because people are jealous. A young kid is, so how is this young kid? And it's like, no, man, like I'll, I'll tell you a, a cool, a, a cool Pete story um, was, we were doing a show in Largo and this is back. Uh, it was a bunch of us. It was uh, uh, all the guys that had opened for Burr. Burr goes, why don't all of my openers do something at Largo? I'll go on. And then you okay. guys will go on a tour together. Okay. I was like, fine. So Pete, Pete was like, Hey man, I just got Kimmel. Can I run the five minutes of Kimmel? And we're all friends with Pete. So we go, yeah. And I remember being in the green room. And Pete goes, oh, dude, I just bought these like fucking twelve hundred dollars shoes, dude. I don't know. And I remember telling Burr, I go, dude, this fucking kid, it's like 18, 19 year old kid. He just bought like thousand dollars shoes. And Burr's like, he better be careful with that. And then after his set, Burr walks up to me and goes, he could buy any shoe he wants. That kid's a fucking <laughs> because Pete was up there as a young kid talking about his mom dating him living with his mom and sister. When a guy comes over, he doesn't know who it's for. And now he's judging this guy, but it all comes from the loss of whatever he went through. And people don't understand how dope that kid is. What a loyal, great friend he is. I've told stories about him on radio and the radio people try to bait me. So Pete Davidson, man, so you're friends and they want this thing. And I'll just tell a great story and I'll be like, yeah, dude, that kid's the fucking best. And he had my back and he did. And they're just like, all right, so the so yeah, and he's dating a lot of, and I'm like, yeah, he's doing well, and he's a great kid. God bless him. Next, you know, it's like, yeah. but it's like, it's like what you said, Dave. It's like people have they see that and they see a guy fucking crushing, and and there just has to be some sort of some sort of thing. So I don't yeah, know. there's a, there is that oh. yeah, there's this animosity and anger and jealousy that people have, and I think that's the sad part about a lot of comics is, and I was like that for a few years because I started with a few people that kind of hit big, and like I had hit, I, and I hit really quick too, and then it like kind of like went down, and it's like because immediately it was like, okay, you're on live at Gotham on Comedy Central, you're doing the HBO festival, you're doing like. I got this stuff and my manager had two of us and kind of gave the shine to another comic and I kind of lost opportunities because of it. And so I just became bitter for a long time in a road comic. But then I enjoyed being a road comic, you know, especially when the gigs are good. I just enjoyed doing it. So it's like I could be doing anything else and I was just happy. So the way that I look at it is like even like getting to this point or that point, it's like I really I really took you know, it took a lot of a lot of hard years of work, but at the same time, it, it's been I've never felt unsuccessful once I decided to stop feeling bitter and comparing myself to everyone else. Uh, one of the biggest things, and that's a perfect point. One of the biggest things in this business is the next guy has nothing to do with you, you know, and the next guy has nothing to do with you, man. You're going to do your thing. Your jokes aren't changing because a guy did or didn't get something, you know, right. and we all have this thing like, fuck, man, I could do that, too. Yeah, you can. But that wasn't your I look at it like that wasn't your path at the time, man. Your path is going to be what it is and what you make of it. So it's like and you also said something that I really like where it's like I just enjoyed doing like getting.
getting on stage and fucking killing and 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 telling jokes and being yourself and being free with that that's like that's it man who gives a fuck with everything else you know yeah because it's it, to me it's the few minutes of freedom i kind of get in a day where it's like there's so much there's so much of a mess of just like stuff that my life can be and then all of a sudden i get this 45 minutes to an hour where i don't have to think about anything else except for like this story these jokes what did it you know and that's even my putting out my next special or, or my first special really like i was gonna film that i did film it i just like i said i didn't like how it looked and now i want it to look better and i don't know if that's being like perfectionist but i just don't want to release anything anymore that i don't think is quality because it just doesn't make sense to me no it's perfect it's perfect. Like somebody's like, oh, you're special on Netflix. When's the next one? And I'm like, the next one's when it's ready. Now, I would like to do it within a year. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, two years. I would like to, yeah. but like, I'm not putting it out unless it's as good, if not better. And like, that's just, that just has to do with the development of the hour. Like, yes. I don't need to, I'd rather have five great hours than seven and two or three were like, eh. I don't want that. I would rather just be like, oh, dude, that fucking dude's hours were fucking dope. All of them. Yeah. Eddie Murphy had two. Yeah. You know, it's like, (laughs) yeah, he had, and everybody talks about those two. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it just seems, no, and yours was really, really good, really well shot. I liked how that was the one thing about shooting it. I shot mine in this giant theater. And what I liked about yours was it was the club it became intimate and when you're watching a comic you need the intimacy of comedy you need to be there needs to be close-ups there needs to be you need to be performing to the camera as well as the audience not just the audience because otherwise it's like very big and it feels like you're watching people watch a comedian do you know what i mean 100 percent, and that's exactly what i went for i was like where is it big enough where it will be nice on camera and it will look sort of grand but just i don't need it to look so grand but something nice on camera but also have a feel of like intimate and it was like levity was perfect because it's like they shot an hbo special there before they can do that but at the same time it's it's also like one of those things where um you could go oh when it's far behind it looks like a really nice thing but oh they're right there with them so it ended up being perfect and it was also pandemic it was still like up and down it was like yeah one of the gaps where it was able to get it in and uh and that you know that's why i did it but i'm done with new york now as far as shooting things so i want to go somewhere in midwest for the next one because well, that's good well and you have the wider audience now i'm sure since that aired i mean i've seen you in england i've seen you in you know all over the place where yeah yeah so i mean that's got to be and i'm sure you've gotten instantaneous feedback and ticket sales from that yeah it, it definitely it's and, it, and the nice thing about it is it's evergreen so it's always growing like people will go like somebody just today was like oh i finally got around to you that's the nice thing about netflix is it's just there it's like it's like, oh, I didn't see it. The Like, you know, and this is no knock on Comedy Central, but Comedy Central, it's like you got to hit it like the day it comes out and like maybe when they re-air it one other time. Other than that, dude, it's clips and it's done. So it's like, yeah, airing once at 11 just doesn't help you. I mean, I'm sorry to the network, but one of the worst things they did was take away presents and try to turn it into five different other things. Yeah. And I think like I think that Net Comedy Central, you know, and again, they helped me with my first one and, and that was all good. But they could have been the comedy thing still, I think. And then Netflix came yeah. in and we're like, hey, man, let's let's just do this. Um, dude, I got something saying time is left because it needs an upgrade. Can you hold on one second? You got it. This is weird. Time. I got to see if what this upgrade means. And then I'll just uh, up upgrade to Zoom One Business Plus. Yes, let's do that. Um, Jesus. Uh, annual and does it say four nineteen on your end? Um, no. Where where would it say that? Mine says time remaining four nineteen. Yeah, yeah. And I just course, I'm trying uh, to I'm trying I'm trying to figure out. All right, two hundred and fifty a year. Yeah, I'll do that. Whatever it is. Yep, and then continue. Okay, next. I mean, payment. Gee, I'm going to have to fucking. All right. So what we'll do is we'll, when this runs out, I'll start another one. I'll delete some, start another one. Yeah, that's easy. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is like, 
fucking hilarious. Just asking for me for money. Mid Zoom's not fucking. <laughs> they're asking for my mid. It's, like it's a prison phone call. <laughs> it's like a peep show. They're yeah, like the, the, the walls coming down. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, yeah. I'm not. Been, that's well, I'm not even close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like that was like at least can you let me finish and then fucking or like use the same card anyway yeah um, <laughs> it's, like, it's like dude i'll never forget dude one the one of the funniest things that i saw i was young dude young and my buddy we, we went to a strip club and i was really young and my buddy was dancing with the stripper and then all of a sudden he ran out of money and she's like whispering in his ear. And then the next thing I saw was him in the strip club at an ATM taking four hundred dollars out. And while he's <laughs> typing on the while he's typing into the ATM, she's rubbing his back. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of girl you want. Just... Like she's just comforting him as he's taking yeah, like, out money great. as he clearly can't afford. Um, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Just go ahead. Is this your credit card? Yeah. Just put cash advance <laughs> and just hand that to me. You're gonna be happy you did this. Uh, so you you said something before. <laughs> you said something before that um, you can be happy. Does. Um, yeah, well, I would grow up with strip clubs in Canada, across from Detroit, so we would go at 19. <laughs> And yeah, you could get in at a fairly young age. So that was always uh oh like our one friend turned 19 and we brought him there and we went to this club and it said it said like 50 naked ass bitches. Like I wish I would have had a camera because my friends and I repeated it for years after we saw it. And we got and it wasn't like a big club, it was one of this like off the Windsor strip <laughs> yeah, yeah, dumps. Yeah. And um we look at we look at this girl and we hand her like some money, which we probably came with a couple hundred together, you know, not even thinking about it because we're drunk and teenagers. And we're like, yeah, it's his birthday. Show him a good time. And, we're, and like, the whole night now on his birthday is just quiet, like real, real quiet. <laughs> and I'm just like, what's what's wrong, man? Did you have fun? He's like, yeah, no, it's fine. And then like later on, he's like starting to tear up. He's like, I had sex with her. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dude, dude, I'm afraid. I was always afraid of strip clubs. I was just afraid. And I remember one time I was, oh my God, dude, somebody, it was off of New York City. It was off of the West Side Highway. And my buddy goes, let's just go in, dude. It's not a, he goes, it's not a strip club. It's called the Hustler Club, but you get drinks. He goes, it's a hustler club. He goes, but you just get drinks every day. And I walked in, dude, and I'm like nervous and I'm kind of freaking out. And I walk in on this Puerto Rican or Dominican chick. I think I used to do a bit about this. Like she sensed my fear because I just start walking and I got my head down and she goes, hey, come here. And dude, she grabs me by my belt. Yeah. And pulls me in, throws her hand down my pants and underwear, grabs shaft balls the whole thing and in a in a latino accent she said i'm having this for dinner tonight and dude i swear <laughs> to god i was so nervous that i just i go thank you i just i just said thank you, you. don't say it. i didn't even know what to say i was just like thank you like i had this like nice guy element i remember one time there was like this russian stripper and she's just like standing there and like obviously she's like topless and she was like talking to, I was like, you got a son. She's like, I got a son. And I go, yeah, man, you should be real careful. Like, and I just started like being like that. And she just goes, dude, are you a cop? I was, just, <laughs> I was like, right, these places, these places aren't for me. Um, you said, I swear to God, she said it like in a Russian accent. She's like, are you a cop? Are you a cop? Um, are, let because me you. Uh, that is the man who brought me here. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're looking to take me to some warehouse like yeah yeah the... what, was that? what was that movie uh where they took people and killed them um oh hostile oh, oh uh, yeah yeah oh um, definitely it could be it could be one of many but yeah that definitely feels like uh oh yeah. if there's an accent i'm always like oh you're you were you were brought here in a crate weren't you like this isn't something you wanted but welcome to america Dude, and it's funny because you see those movies where it happens like Taken yeah. and like the taxi driver like checks where they're checking in. Mm -hmm. Dude, something happened when we were just in London. I want to ask you about something else in a second, but just to tell you, we were in London and then we took the train to Paris. Because once my work was done and I, I was with the family, once my work was done, like that's where my head was at with the London trip. It was like my head was at this with the London trip. It was at let's do the shows. Let's go see the Giants and Packers. And then once that's done, like once 
I can go to Paris with my family and just, there's no work. There's no obligation. You know, if we go on some fucking quick tour during, to see some historic shit, fine, but let's just do that. So we get to Paris and we took that two hour bullet train and we get off the train and everyone's tired and everyone had to take a piss and we're just walking through and they go, taxi, taxi, all this shit. So yeah. me, I just go taxi for four. Like, and he goes, yes, come with me. And then all of a sudden, as we're walking past, I we're walking past like, that things that say taxi. And yeah. now I'm like with my family and like, we're walking across the street. My wife's going like, babe, is this? And then he like, keeps so he goes, no, no, it's okay. Just what? And we walk across the street and there's like a line of cars that don't say taxi. Right. And then there's this, this young kid driving it, younger kid, like early twenties. And like the windshield is cracked. And like I pack my family in. Yeah. And um, my wife is going like, and I go, no. And he's like, it's all right. You know, and he puts our stuff in the back and now I'm like on the way to the hotel and all my shits in the back. And I'm looking at this cracked window. Meanwhile, there were all these like giant Mercedes sprinter taxis, which I wanted to get in. Right. And I'm just, but we, I just wanted to get out of there. And the way he was like, Oh, I got you four. I just followed him. Cause I wanted to get the fuck to my hotel. Yeah, of course. And dude, they charged me $90 to get 14 minutes, 13 minutes. And then after that, and I was basically, oh, this is what the guy does. He has his friend wait across the street and his friend is in the car and they're yeah. just taking Americans that come off the train or whoever comes off the train. And it, but thinking about it is kind of creepy. Not that they were going to do, not, they're just taking advantage of tourists. But when you see that done and then you see shit that happens in movies, it's not that far fetched. If you're like in another country and they know you have money and they can, they know the lay of the land and you don't. I was just yeah. like, dude, that was fun. And like, it was with my family. So like, I made sure they got out first as I sat there. So they yeah. don't leave with the shit. And then they took the stuff out. And then I looked at the dude and he's like, he paid on a meter, but he had on his phone, which is probably an app that he just like made up. <laughs> yeah, of course. He, yeah. That's what you just cough the whole time. So they don't want your organs. If you're ever in that situation, <laughs> just talk about how your whole family's riddled with some disease. <laughs> but speaking of family, you have how many children? One son, seven. You have one seven-year-old son. Yes. You're, and you're married for how long? Uh, eighteen years. Oh, so she's been it from the, she's been in it basically from the gate from the get. Oh yeah, yeah. Since I, I met her at Second City, actually, uh, doing uh, improv and sketch writing so when I first started. Was SNL the the first dream? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And it died, but it was the first dream. The first. <laughs> Yeah, but it's a funny thing because it took you to where it's funny how like those steps take you. So was it like me? Because we're around the same age. It was Eddie Murphy, right? Was it Eddie? It was Eddie Murphy. Yeah, it was Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. My dad showed me. Yeah, my dad showed me Eddie Murphy, and then also he would wake me up on Saturdays to watch SNL because he knew I love sketch comedy. And we also, when I was, I was a little older, not much older, but we would get kids in the hall coming over because we bordered Canada. So I would watch that too. So like I grew up just loving sketch. I, I still do. Okay. So wow, that's interesting. So I'm glad well, we're the talking reason about why I even went to Crowder was uh largely the sketch part of it. You know, it's what I like to do. Like a lot of the sketches is just what I enjoy is having free range of sketch writing. That dude, that's so interesting. So your first real passion and love is sketches. Originally, yeah. Um all right, so let me talk about Second City. So when you went to Second City, is it like a, a classroom? And then you like break up into, like, how does that work exactly for anybody listening? Originally it was. It was uh, it was different classes. You went there as a training program. And I met a bunch of people there. I'm still friends with most of them today. But like the classes get smaller as you go up. Then you have to audition for the conservatory. Then you're in the conservatory. And essentially you're kind of like an understudy for the tour co stuff like that so there's like levels to it you know it's uh like scientology for comedy and they sort of uh but it was really cool because like you're learning from people like keegan michael key had come out of there larry joe campbell and like when i was there tim robinson who has that show i think you should leave yeah. on netflix dude dude, that show he, makes me laugh dude dude it's great he started right before me and sam richardson who's on that show we had an improv troupe called members only which was you know, it's sad. We had members only jackets while we did it. But what I did was I, there was this, I grew up on the border of Detroit and gross point. And like one side is a fairly nice suburb. And the other side is at the time, the worst neighborhood in America, 
Which is so, what, Gross Point? No, that's Detroit. Gross Point's nice. Detro- Detroit, uh, the east side of Detroit is what it borders. And okay. there's a street called Mac where literally half the street is Detroit and half the street right down the middle. And you can see, like, if you stand in the middle, to the left, it's, like, paved and taken care of. And to the right, it's, like, Iraq. So yeah, it's yeah. just, and there was a bar there called the Village Idiot, and I convinced the guy to do five dollars all you could drink cores, which is not legal, and then five dollar ticket sales. So we would do improv, and and that's when I started doing stand up actually, because I'm like, let's do stand up too. So it would be like twenty different people going on stage in a night, but then we had about a hundred people packed into this audience where there was a stage. It was sold out every time because it was mostly kids underage drinking. And the only time that anybody ever got, uh, I think hurt was a cop came in all high on Coke and he was off duty and somebody fucked him up. And then they, uh, yeah, they never really bothered us, but they they never really cared. It's Detroit. They had actual things to do. Yeah. So so we ran that for years, just doing improv or not years. I guess it was probably the first year. And then it just got to, where we couldn't do it anymore but it was fun because it was really like in front of a tough room of very drunk people but it was fun that dude that sounds amazing it sounds it sounds definitely nerve-wracking but hilarious that you were first of all the fact that you're in members only jackets is already hilarious but so how many of you how many of you were in that sketch group there was a few as me my wife uh, my friend ken sam was there he would be an alternate uh, another guy named topher there's like probably about six or seven people my buddy jesse yeah there's like seven people maybe that were in it and then we had a few other ones that i would do like i was in motor city improv for eight years which was i did stand up every monday and tuesday at this place called joey's and that was in detroit and monday was open mic do all stand up and then tuesday we warm up the show with stand up and then we would have standing room only for our improv shows and then we would do that and we did that forever like we would just it was crazy it was like and you you know you could smoke i was drinking at the time like it was really like a lot of fun to learn how to do that and to not be afraid on stage and you were you were what in your early 20s yeah 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 i think i started when i was probably about 20 21 and then i stopped doing it with them when i was probably yeah so i guess it was less than that i guess 27 or 28 i think is when we stopped that, but we did that it for must years. Have you, that must have helped you for stand up too like just just being up there like once you do that because now what is it like i don't i don't know i'm sure a sketch could bomb in a bar what is that do they just start like do they start like kid like do you do you get heckled mid sketch? Yeah, like well, you certainly get um you just get the same things. Like there's bar prov, then there's improv. If you want to do improv, you go do something called a herald, which is one long scene invented by Del Close, who was like the godfather of improv, who's also was a lunatic. It's just a really long scene. And uh then you can go there and get like more of the art community. Bar prov is basically like bring people up on stage, have them play dating game, have Got them do, it. you know, like, or you yell out, you know, like, what do you want this guy to be? You know, like, it's a whore. It's a dildo. Like anytime they, you ask for anything from the audience, it's always something. And then yeah. when we would do the <laughs> ending where we would have to play characters, most of the comics would write suggestions and then leave them inside of like the hat. And my yeah. friend Matt would put the most vile things imaginable. <laughs> like, I'd have to like throw out four pieces of paper that I couldn't even read. <laughs> Just like, uh, that's fucking great, dude. So, yeah. so if you sign, so if you're in that area and you want to go to second city, you have to sign up and you just get in a general bigger class, right? If you're there, I mean, if if somebody wants to do a Detroit closed, it was sad. Like we were moving up and we did a show. I wrote it with uh, another group. We It was called Meet in the Middle, M-E-A-T. And it was, a, a, it was about a town that separated the gays and the straights. And they went to, this is, you know, 2005 maybe. Uh-huh. So it separated the gays and the straights and they had to learn to live in their own cities. So like all of a sudden the straight people couldn't get their hair done. And like one of their Subaru dealerships closed. 
And then like one of the gay guys flower shop shut down because there was nobody there to go to apologize for their wives. So it was like, eventually they like come together. They had to come together. Yeah. 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 So, and then it's filtered with different sketches throughout the entire show, but that's like the main running theme. So we did that. And then they, they shut down shortly after because they moved it out of downtown Detroit way out into the suburbs and put it on top of a building that had a dance club under it. And there's no mics. Uh, and they didn't turn down the dance music so you'd be on stage and all you'd hear is just bass coming through the floor while you're trying to do improv <laughs> dude and wait so where's the um the and there's a there's a big one in uh, chicago chicago's right? the main one that's where it started and i don't know if there's i don't know if it's still in toronto but toronto was the secondary that's is what that sctv mike, mike uh, michael myers did come out of chicago but originally toronto but okay. then went to Chicago. That's how like Sam and Tim were. They were both Detroit guys and then they got brought into Chicago. So like Chicago is kind of the place where they go to to find the talent, at least at, you know, at least the last up until the last few years, as far as I know. Do you know Tim Robinson or no? I don't know him well. No, I've only I've done uh, improv with him a few times. And obviously, and I know Sam, but it's like I I, I know him well enough to where I've worked with him and been on stage with him. And dude, he was always, always funny, like unbelievably funny. Dude, that guy is like the way he gets, dude, the uh, the sketch where they were in the haunted house and he oh, goes, you guys could, you guys could say anything, <laughs> dude. He, just, he kept cursing and the guy's like, dude, what do you do? Dude, and he goes, oh my, like how literal he took things and the way he was serious, dude. That guy, well, he was on SNL, I think only for a season. Is that like a- was Well, he was on for a season and then um, they put him into a writer and they, instead of letting him do be on the show, which I guess there was like, I, I don't really know what happened. I've heard things, so I guess I shouldn't say because I guess yeah. I kind of know, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. Right, right. Um, But- he was then a writer for years and I, uh, Jason Sudeikis and Bill Hader were ones that got Detroiters brought to comedy central oh, okay, and kind of helped them out because they were like, this guy's a huge talent and you gave him a year of a chance, you know, in the feature spot of yeah. SNL. And they kind of just with a lot of people though, over the years, they just didn't utilize them correctly. I mean, SNL sadly is notorious for that. I, I remember, um, you know, there were some people that you wondered if they were going to get a writer to to get them through with characters. And I remember when Will Forte, who I fucking do, Will Forte to me is one of the funniest. But I remember when Will Forte first was on SNL, he was doing little things. And I'm going, dude, this guy is like. I'm telling you, like this guy, and and I heard that he was. Um, I don't know how true. Like I don't. You hear all these stories, but I heard Will Forte had like three auditions, three years in a row, and uh, if he wasn't gonna get it the third year, he wasn't gonna. But, dude, like MacGruber movie, and like, and one thing I noticed about so all those. Funny. Oh, dude, MacGruber the movie, but the the why I respect people, um, improv people, and and people that start in improv or or just have the because all the great ones commit so much to ridiculousness. And that mm -hmm. like, for me, like that's what really makes me laugh when I watch things. Cause I love, even though like I used to joke and be like, I could do stand up and get on SNL, but my dream was never that because I never, I never wanted to be in sketches. I wanted to do what Eddie Murphy did, but I never wanted to be in sketches. You know, right. I always was like, Oh, that would be, but the things that make me laugh when I watch things like, dude, everything is commitment. Borat, dude, Borat. I was just watching the shit when he went to that 1800s. He went to that 1800s museum and he was just like, it's like they say America has the best technology. These tools are primitive. And yeah. the guy goes, no, dude, you're in a museum. You're in a, he goes, are you a slave? Dude, and, and like, it's just so like to stay in that is my favorite thing. And Will Forte and and Tim Robinson and a lot of I mean well that's what made Dana Carvey and Will Will Farrell so you know so you know great for me but um oh yeah well Will Forte did one of my favorite sketches ever which made me love him which because it is Halloween it reminded me it's when he goes to somebody's house but he's trick or treating as an adult but he all he's just trying to let them know he's a, a, a he's on a sex offender registry. Oh my God. Dude. So he shows up and he, the guy's like, you're a bit old to be trick or treating. And he's like, yeah, I'm just a sex offender. He's like, yeah, that's a weird costume. He's like, 
yeah costume okay so he's like he's dancing around it he's like are you really so he's like so this is just a costume he's like yes i am uh, I, it's just a costume but i did also uh, I did also sexually assault four teenagers. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> you, you know it's funny now that now that we're talking, Dave, and I realize this when you were on Bobby's podcast the day that we met, yeah, Bobby was showing clips of things that you did where you were doing your own personal kind of sketches or like you know, like mock commercials, right? I remember yeah. that. So yeah, now- yeah that makes sense now that it was like, that's your, that was your go-to. That's like what you, that's amazing, dude. Yeah. The one I've done in like the one that I wrote that I'm probably most proud of. Well, like people like one called candy ass, which is just a candy man parody, but it's with Brian Stelter who used to be on CNN and I just play Brian Stelter. So I appear in the mirror and it's like, it's very juvenile, but I'm just like sucking on lollipops and I'm like, you know, coming after it. But then I, I see a girl and I'm like, ew, like where you know. <laughs> and it's just it's it's just juvenile but it's fun but one of my favorite ones was uh we did called opi uh is the opioids because we just had the sponsor opioids for the day so it's just me like in the beginning talking about how like opioids take away my pain like it's just like any other medical commercial yeah. then by the end i'm just like i have a gag ball in and i'm like just dragging myself across a hotel floor while two guys wearing tuxedos and like a pig in a bear mask are just throwing <laughs> money at me and it's like another one it's just like the woman who's in the oh, beginning she's just like getting arrested because she's od'd on a steering wheel but the <laughs> last time you saw her she's like my kids now have trouble keeping up with me but then she's you're, just, and you're doing that on the show yeah yeah that was one of the sketches we did yeah it, it was called uh opioids so you get so you got free, so that's the nice thing about and, and we like like the way that we started this podcast talking about you can do your own thing no matter what the nice thing is if you wanted to, well, like, dude, I just got this. Um, I I got the new iPhone, right? And yeah. the guy was like, the guy goes, dude, he goes, I don't know if you know, like, the three cameras. And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm not really big on photos. He's like, it's one of the best cameras in the world. I'm like, great. He's like, by the way, he goes, the cinematography like version of it. He goes, you can create something that literally looks like a movie. And then he goes, yeah. Lady Gaga shot her one of her videos with the the whole thing was an iphone and he goes and it was two iphones ago but with the same type of feature and then he showed me what it looked like and i'm like dude you could do a movie a sketch show literally if you get your friends and the right angle like you can do anything now yeah bobby did a movie with um steve soderbergh who did uh um the oceans 11 movies yeah and he the guy did it all on an iphone Bobby said he was like up on a ladder with a light holding an iPhone down on him. Really? And he did the entire movie. Yeah. And it's a really good movie. It's a horror movie. I think it's called Unsane. And uh, Bobby's a cop in it. And it's it's really good. And yeah, it was that whole thing was shot on an iPhone that has got to be at least six years old now. Dude, it was so fun. I was thinking like you can shoot a late night TV show or a sketch show or any kind of like even like shooting mini series with an iPhone and, and like you need lights and this. <laughs> and like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and YouTube, it's so funny, man. Cause, and I'll, I'll be honest, like I think doing a special and I don't know where your special is going or where you want it to go, but honestly, I think the two places, I, cause you got to go where eyeballs are. And I think, yeah. you know, you got like the, the nice thing is if, if a big platform doesn't take something like, dude, right now, YouTube is like, you go to fucking, you put something on YouTube and, and it starts getting spread out. You're going to get as many, if not more than anywhere else ever. Yeah. That's why I think like what Bobby did by going to Louis CK, cause he wasn't getting an offer anywhere. They did it. They set it up. It looks great. Killbox. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and that's, it's one of those where, yeah, I, I think you just have to put it out. I mean, I know a lot of comics who Shane Gillis was one of them. He just put it on YouTube. Um, yeah, you I know, think Sam and Mark did, and they and, both and, did, and Shane did, and uh, the first one to ever do it is a really close friend of mine, and that's Brett Ernst. Brett Ernst, Brett's is, great, dude. I love Brett, dude. Brett's first uh, YouTube thing called Principal's Office. He was the first one before anyone's like, "Oh, you can do that," and he ended up getting like three or four million in like a year, and then it built, and people were like, "Oh shit!" Like you can do, like you can utilize now. And and the thing is, like, it's not oh only the big comics get those. No, 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 dude. Big comics are doing YouTube now, which is fantastic yes. for everybody. 
Yeah, it's great because you have your own platform. You don't have to wait for permission. And that's just something that I love about it now. And I didn't know Brett was the first one to do it. But yeah, he's another guy who I watched him just tell. Yeah, I, th- I worked with him in the Des Moines Funny Bone like probably a decade ago. And we just hit it off. But it was like watching him perform it was another guy who took this vulnerability and these stories and yeah. just had like that's what i love about certain comics you're watching them and you're going nobody else has that joke because it's not it's just their life or it's clearly their opinion and their voice and they're the only one that has it and he's one of those guys those are the jokes that are the separation of of comedy i think like you said i think when you watch somebody tell a story that's about their life their family their vulnerability their you know, I don't know if you do jokes. I know that you said that you you had uh, an addiction or you were addict or oh, are an tons addict. of it, tons of stories. Yeah, and and those stories like nobody's gonna ha- like. There are definitely other addicts and there are other people that had to get sober, but your shit is you. Like nobody's taking your fucking story. And no, and I love telling it. You know, I, I have a story. You know, in my act that I'm working on for this where. Um, I remember I, Colin Quinn had seen me do it and he goes, that's genius. And I never thought I would hear those words come out of his mouth walking off stage, but that kept me going for another, you know, couple of years. Cause it was when I was first tinkering with it and it was just about hitting an 11 year old with a brick when we were like eight and nine, it wasn't like last Tuesday, but it's like, <laughs> but it was like taking out a school bully and then discussing stuff we did as a kid going through, like going to the most vulnerable places and being willing to share that with an audience. Cause sometimes the first time I tried, I remember I was like, my dad died when I was a teenager and a guy like fake laughed really loud. And it made me furious, you know, like, yeah. and I didn't even know how to, but it was my own fault because I was trying to go into these new waters without actually having the experience of how to do it. Wow. But eventually it just becomes your voice because you become yourself on stage. You start, that's it. sort of wanting to be somebody else. And then you, you, once you find yourself is when you really take off. Truer words have never been spoken about comedy. That's exactly what it is. I had this fake angry guy persona because I was afraid I was insecure. So I'm like, what's the deal with this? You know, and people, I remember my roommate from Boston was like, Paul, that's not you, man. You're like a nice, easy going, like you're, you're more deep than that. But, but I was just, you're so afraid to, to get to, to fail, to, to not do well, to not get left. So you just come out and then all of a sudden you become the you and the funny stories. And you just say all those things that are really true. And you're like, Oh dude, I'm free. And you know, it's funny what you said when you said Colin Quinn said that to you, said that to you. And after Colin Quinn said that to you, you could go on for a little more. And, and that's the, that's the thing. I, I spoke about this a little bit on Rogan where Chris Rock said I killed and then we walked past each other and he didn't say anything to me. And I knew that he said I just killed. So I thought when we made eye contact, he would say something and he didn't. And it was like, ah, but then there are times where you're, you're down. Colin was one of those guys. I call Colin Quinn like a Jedi of stand. Oh, dude, he's he's a Jedi, and just and I, one of the best to ever live. And people don't I, not, and I should say people don't know. A lot of people know, but more people should but no, know. But not enough people know. Not enough people and, know. And, and like we in the know know. Yes. But there there are people, and there are a lot of people, but like they know a little bit. But Colin Quinn is so great, and he's on the podcast. I said, dude, you're like a Jedi, and he left. And he's like, I saw your first special, and it's great. And in your mind, you're going like, what? But um, I. Yeah, man, like I remember um, somebody told me like on Twitter, I was just feeling like down about something. I sold a bunch of tickets someplace, then the next place the tickets were like, all right. And not that I was down because things were still going great, but I was just kind of, and then all of a sudden somebody's like, hey, dude, uh, Joey Diaz said something on his Patreon about how funny you are. So, And you just like, you get those things and- some You're the first think, person who's ever been cheered up by Twitter, by the way. Yes, I know, right? I know. The only comic. <laughs> oh, no, usually I'm like, it's so <laughs> evil. Know. Yeah, I was like, you just like, you ever like look and like, you almost like lean back as you scroll? Yeah. Like, like, oh, like nobody can, nobody yeah, can like, see me and I'm going like that. But yeah, um, it's PTSD. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I mean, no, no, you, but... no, no, it's funny. No, what I was saying was like, I remember... I remember seeing that. And for people to hear us talk like this, they're like, oh man, what are you just patting yourself on? It's like, no, no, man, you're not patting yourself on the back. You don't understand what that does 
what that does when somebody that's lived in those shoes and somebody that has done something and you feel a certain way and you get some sort of validation from a legend, dude, from a legend. Like I said to my wife, I go, if, if Eddie Murphy says I'm funny, like for me, I'm like, I could literally like, I'll keep going. Cause I love it. But like, that's when I know I could be like, all right, man, I did it. Like, that's the, that for me, that that would be the one, like, was it, would that be the same for you or no? Dude, Who your... Yeah, basically. I mean, one of the other guys I loved was Chappelle and I, I ended up opening for him a couple of times and it was, uh, I shouldn't say it was, is Chappelle, but um, it was, I was 19, 20, 21 in college. And then, at 22, I was standing in front of 7,000 people in an arena opening for him. And he wow. said I was electric. And it's like walking off stage to that, you're like, I don't know how this hat Like, in it, it yeah. at that young, I couldn't even wrap my head around it, you know? And plenty of people were pissed because he was, like, the guy at the time. This was, like, the second he walked away from his show in, like, 04. So, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a crazy experience. But that's, yeah, that's how I feel, like... Even when Nick DiPaolo comes on our show or Jim Brewer just, you know, had come on and I did Jim's show, these are all people who I grew up watching and admiring. So if you say something that makes them laugh, I don't, it just feels good because you feel like you're doing something right. If you're even somewhat welcomed into that circle, like it's how anybody would be in any business. If you like, if you want to be, you know, if you're in real estate, you obviously want to be the best at it. You want to go into some group. You want to be elite somehow. You want to be, I mean, why wouldn't you want to feel that? That's just our version of it compared to everybody else's job. But there's a flip side to it. And the flip side is we shouldn't be that excited since we've dedicated 20 years and we should be funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, I always think of that. Like, someone's like, dude, so and so said I'm funny. And I'm like, you kind of did been doing this for a couple of decades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah, like I would, hope it, you. I yeah, hope I you hope they would. You were. If it would suck if they were just like, ah, uh, you know, it wasn't that funny. You're like, oh, you know, but I, yeah, yeah I, I, we should yeah. be a little. <laughs> there are people that do that though, where you, I've seen, like, you know, you've seen like a guy who's open mic for like fifteen years, and it's like I don't understand. Like, do you not own bullets? Like, why do you do this? Yeah. Like, yeah. there's there no way out for you. <laughs> like, you just. <laughs> You you think this is a good idea? You're telling the same jokes I saw when I first saw you do stand up, getting on an open mic list, and you're like, I don't know what's a, I don't know why it's not working out. The definition of insanity is doing the yes. same thing over and over again and, and expecting you, a different result, and yeah. that's like a good yeah. chunk of comedians. That yeah, that's something that I would never just even waste my time in this. But let me ask you a question. So you mentioned something before about um like addiction or also mental stuff do you do you was therapy something you did to combat that or or you just kind of what's that still do therapy yeah okay and you would you say like that was a big help it is it's it's odd because i have different things that pop up in in uh I, that i have to combat um it, it all stemmed from when i was a kid all sorts of stuff but uh it's it's the, my biggest problem is depression and severe anxiety. Okay. And that's something that for some reason didn't affect me on stage. But if I'm talking to anybody and like in a group of four or whatever, it still affects me. And it didn't, I think it's why I partied as hard as I did in high school that led to like a lot of arrest and stuff. But yeah. um, I, yeah, I, is depression and that, but then, it, you know, you find out you have like manic, I have manic issues. I have bipolar and it, it, it's it sucks because the more I'm into it, the more it's like, oh, there's more stuff that's wrong with me. And then everything that I do is to I don't want to say self-medicate in a form it is, but it's because I have to I don't want to face it. So I have to do something to avoid it. So my avoidance throughout my entire life was always like, OK, drugs, alcohol, whatever I could get my hands on to not actually have to look myself in the mirror and and feel what I didn't want to feel or see what I didn't want to see. Yeah. And I still fight it a lot. And that's what sucks is like I'm sober, but it's like I I, I always thought like, oh, there's going to be a point where this is going to come that Robert Downey Jr. moment almost where he's like, you know, we, you just decide. And it's like, I'm not, I've, I still have to fight that. You know, I still have to yeah. fight it every day. And it, it sucks because it's always, it's like, it's just a monkey. I can't get off my back. 
Yeah. And, I, you know, when you said like I had talking to four people or social anxiety and stuff and like, you know, I had a really, really bad bout with depression um, in, in 2016 that I didn't think I was going to get out of. And you go to this dark place yet, like it's weird because like I'm a happy guy, like I'm a happy. So like being depressed hurt me because like. I was like, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to ever kill myself. So I'm either right. going to live, live miserable or not, but you go into this place and you're just like, and it's just really funny how our, how we can go to that place yet we give joy. Like we take people out of that place. And sometimes a lot yeah. of times no, I am right. out of it now. I am out of it now, but then you're always like, I said to somebody that had it and they heard me tell a story about it. I go, and they go, yeah, dude, when I feel that thing coming, when I feel it creeping up, you just got to like nip it in the bud. And it's like, I've realized that that's what it is. And it's in my family. Anxiety is mm -hmm. in my family. Um, all that stuff of, of, you know, feeling this and that going down a fucking spiral OCD going down those down that, you know, that route health anxiety, because some trauma shit happened when I was younger Yeah, and, and all that stuff. And you're just like, all right, I'm going to know now, but I'm old enough. See when we're, when we're young and dumb, we're like, ah, booze, fucking. <laughs> yeah, of course. Anything. Yeah. Any, anything gets you out of that. Now you're like, oh, no, that's a Band-Aid. And that's that's not really going to like that. At the end of the day, I got to look that devil in the face and try mm. to figure it out. But um, it's a cloud. Really it's a, not, it's why they call it a black cloud, because it feels like it's following you. But I always look at it as almost like this other person who takes over. And it's like there's days. And I mean, it's. It happens with me so much that I say it's, there's days where it's like I just have to fight to get out of bed, and it's a lot of the time. And I've always been like that, though. So it's nothing that I'm not used to. I've been like that since I was like ten. So it, yeah. it's just something that I fight to get through, and I get through every day. And like I still put on a smile and pretend that I, you know, like whatever what isn't affecting me, but it does, and it sucks. But I mean, I also think, I think the bleak outlook in those moments is a benefit to comedy for me. Because if you can think like the worst thing about somebody else and then figure out how to like yeah. verbalize that where you're at and then you can take it down from there or like you can think yeah. the worst thing about yourself, like you can you can admit a lot of stuff when you hate yourself in those moments, you know, you can look at you can I always you know, I look inward, but the way that I look at it is like, yeah, I'm I'm broken. I don't think it's ever going to be fixed. 100 percent but i do know that i'm fighting it every day yeah. and i know that i have a son so i'm not leaving anytime soon you know at least by my own hand right right and and you know i think though off of what you just said i think everybody's broken and i don't I know do if, and i don't know if everybody broken is going to fully fix it so all we can do in life is you know talk to somebody if that helps yeah. Um, I'm not against medication. If that helps, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, like whatever the fuck it is, like, I don't judge like people like, Oh man, fuck. you know, there are people like, fuck that. I ain't taking that drug shit. I'm not, I'm not. And it's like, no man, like if you have a chemical imbalance, take that drug. Like you, you have a chemical imbalance. Like you're not beating that. Like you're, there's something in chemically wrong with your brain right. that this pill will actually fix. Do that, do that. I don't understand. Like people are like, no, nah, man, that's not re that's not natural. You know, that's that's what are you what are you a drug addict? And I'm like, no, man, this is actually fine. And there's really no sexual side effects. And I'm I'm happier and my OCD has gotten less. And yeah. when things get really bad, I feel this, like we're both on Zoloft, but go on. Well, no, dude, you know what I had to get off Zoloft because Zoloft <laughs> kept me here. Zoloft okay. was not good for me. I took Zoloft yeah, and Dude, that was Zoloft, the only thing that worked for me. Dude, Zoloft kept me here. I felt locked in the same place. It was fucking. But then I was like, then I went off of things for like 11 years. And then somebody was like, what's your main problem? And I go, my main problem is the anxiety and the OCD kind of go together. And they were like, oh, so you need an anti-anxiety that focuses on OCD. And they're like, there's like, there is something for that. And the pill was called Luvox. And they go, okay. Lu Luvox, take a very low dose and see. And I took a very low dose. It did nothing side effects. So I was like, oh, fuck it. Yeah. And people are like, oh, man, don't rely on that. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of fucking not ha not stuck on one thought for 45 minutes in my hotel room where I'm sweating <laughs> because I can't put a water bottle down because I keep thinking of the same fucking thing. So you know what? I'm going to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not I'm not trying to straighten out every tassel on my carpet right now. So it looks the exact same. You know, it's like, yeah, no, I get it. Like, And that's how I was as a kid, too. And I think there is an OCD to that where mine, I don't think was as severe, but there is that 
Oh, sorry. Hold on. One second. No, all good, man. Element of uh, when when I was a kid, like I would touch like my right knee three times before I got up and stuff, and I never realized like that's kind of the beginning of an addiction is the fact that your mind is making you do something or forcing you to do something that you don't want to do. And that's really what, you know, eventually an addiction becomes that. And and it's about control. And it's very hard when you don't have a lot of self-control, but you want to have it. And then when you're in addiction, you want to try to attempt to control other people, but that's impossible. You're just pissing them off. That's why controlling people bother me, because it's like you do realize it's not working and everyone just hates you. Dude, you just made me. Yeah. And you just made me realize something about my life just now where I was like, yeah, I tapped things three times, but not that I was like an addict, but I would mask. I would I would I would band aid things with drinking and partying, getting arrested, getting in trouble outlet. I would really kind of just really kind of act out. My parents got divorced and I would do these things. And looking back, I'm like, yeah, dude, the OCD, the tapping, I would walk around things instead of through. And people were like, well, there's no, that doesn't make any sense because he could walk right through. But for me, it was like, no, this is the safety and, and touching something or like, I would even count, count one, two, three. Or I remember one time I was in a hotel and I just sat on a bed on the corner of the bed and I couldn't move a certain way because of a bad thought until I had another thought. And that's when I was like, all right, man, I got to go to a doctor and talk to somebody. And, you know, things got better. Yeah. I mean, and that's not, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. And the problem is, is that we've stigmatized it a lot in our culture, but the reality is, is like you said, I do think most people suffer. And I do think, especially since the pandemic, more people will suffer than we've ever seen before I, because yeah. there's a fear sort of ingrained in them. And, and like you said, I think it's good that you have that because that's going to help you relate to an audience, to people, to humanity, and to just show your flaws. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. And that's why people need to come to our shows. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So tell me about that before we get out of here. Uh, we got a couple minutes here before this thing goes out again, but um dave land such a pleasure and we're definitely going to do this again because it was one of those where time goes quick and when yes. you know time goes quick in a podcast you're like oh shit and and um what you know what we'll do next time we're in town together we'll do one in a live studio we'll do it yes. in a studio um where can everybody see your your so talk about your show and talk about your uh tour uh louder with crowder monday through thursday and then we're doing a small tour right now uh well it's it's arenas it's kind of nice and some theaters uh we're going to be in Nashville at the Ryman, which was the original Opry and a few other yeah. places. It's pretty cool, man. I'm sure you've, it's, Amazing. I, I, I yeah, can't I wait, did dude. It, I did it. Uh, I haven't opened for like a big, I haven't opened for Burr in like five years, but I remember doing the Ryman and I remember, I love how you were like, yeah, we're doing some arenas. So it's nice. Yeah. It's really fucking nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it is. It feels good. Yes. Yeah. No, it, no. Well, you know what though? You're, you're, uh, you're you're funny enough and deserve it all. So it's that's what's Thank fantastic. You, and and all the moves that you've made have been right. And that's why you're you're growing the way you are. So everybody needs to uh and you could they could check that out at what site? Uh they can go to uh just go to DaveLandau.com. I got links to everything on there. Yeah, DaveLandau.com. Check out his stand-up, check out all the stuff he does, check out his his show uh louder with Crowder, check out his check out his tour. All of that stuff, dude. This is one of the real ones, one of the funny ones. Um, and uh, check out my uh, shows, my tour coming up. I'm going to be at the Stress Factory on the 10th through the 12th of November. I also have Connecticut coming up. I have uh, a bunch of new dates that are going to be on paulverzi.com. And we're starting to add stuff for the 2023 tour. Check out the Anything Better podcast, our football picks. Um, and that's it. Uh, get the Verzi effect everywhere you get your podcast, Spotify, iTunes, and all that. Dave, thanks so much for being here, man. Great time, dude. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, man. I'll see you soon. Later, dude.